On October 21st, 2021, a Western movie entitled Rust was being filmed in Bonanza Creek, New Mexico. It was a low-budget, independent film, but the star of the movie was an A-lister, Alec Baldwin. Baldwin was not only starring in the film, he was also an executive producer. The person in charge of the firearms on the set was armorer Hannah Gutierrez. Hannah was only 24 years old, and this was only the second film she had been hired as the armorer. One other crew member who had access to the weapons and the ammunition on the set was the prop master, Sarah Zachary. On October 21st, Alec Baldwin was rehearsing a scene with a cross draw, and while rehearsing, the gun went off. The bullet struck cinematographer Helena Hutchins and director Joel Souza. Joel survived, but Helena did not. And now the question is, how did a 24-year-old armorer get put in charge of the guns on the set of a Western movie starring A-lister Alec Baldwin? And what role did alleged drug use play in what happened to Helena? Tonight, we take a look at the relationships of the decision makers and take a closer look at Hannah Gutierrez as we investigate the Baldwin movie shooting. I'm Vinnie Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Another big day inside the courtroom. And as we watch the trial, um, you have to understand what we're watching right now in New Mexico is trial number one. This is the trial of Hannah Gutierrez. So it's all about what she did, what she didn't do, her actions, her lack of actions, safety protocols. Was her behavior reckless, criminally reckless behavior on the set of the movie? And that's what's at stake here for Hannah Gutierrez. This is her trial, trial number one. There's going to be trial number two. That's going to be for Alec Baldwin. And I, and I think in that trial, there's going to be a di much different focus. It'll be on what happened once the gun was handed to him and what about him as executive producer of the, of the show, of the movie. What, what role... And how did that impact what was done day in and day out on that set in terms of cutting corners, saving money, et cetera? So trial two coming this summer for Alec Baldwin. Trial one happening right now, two completely different defendants. One is a 24-year-old armor on her second movie. The other, someone who's been in Hollywood for a long, long time. Now, when we go on the set, of this of this film rust what we're understanding and learning is really the complexity of the relationships of everyone on this set and who was working for who who reported to who who was really in charge and and i think for the jury as they watch this trial that's something that they want to understand because i know as i'm watching it that's that's what i'm trying to figure out i'm not a movie actor i've never been in a movie but learning how things were done here, first, is surprising to me. But number two, it's, it's trying to figure out. Because if you're trying to hold someone responsible, this isn't the classic court TV case where someone comes up with a plot to commit a crime, a murder, a robbery, whatever it is, and then they execute it. No, this is like people not doing their jobs. But who's in charge? Who's responsible? How did it really happen? And, and to me, it's not crystal clear, but a lot of it has to do with the relationship that everyone has and, and the power that they wield on that set to do things. Because nobody's owning up to introducing that live round in the set. Nobody is. And, and you would think that on a movie set, it would be easy to figure out who brought in the live ammo. But it's not. It's not simple here. Not at all. Not an easy case for this jury, by the way. Not an easy case for them. Most, most of the time when you have a case where you're not talking about, like, I intended to do this. You know, we plotted to, to kill so-and-so. Like, then the jury can say, okay, either they did or they didn't. But here, we know what people did. The question is, what is it? Is it, is it, is it, is it a crime, what happened here? It's a tragedy. There's absolutely civil liability. But is it a crime is the question. Now, for Hannah Gutierrez... Uh, the question tonight for me is, you know, will she tell her story? 
We've seen police interviews. The jury has seen police interviews where she's telling her story. But will she get up on the witness stand live in front of those folks in the box and, and tell them what happened, what she was doing, why she was doing it? And where that live round came from? I, you, you know, in a case like this, it's, it's difficult, right? She's 24 years old, but I think the jury would better understand who she is if she actually testified live in front of them um, because they've seen the police interviews. I don't think those are great for her, but I think she can help herself, but she'll have to face some difficult cross-examination. And we're going to talk about that in the show tonight. We're going to talk about the relationships that everyone had. But it was a big day today, another big day in the courtroom. Here's some of the biggest moments. In our conclusions, uh, we determined that the management team was responsible for a series of failures that, uh, in our opinion, accumulated in an accident. We mean the chain of command um, above Hannah Gutierrez, um, beginning um, at the lowest level with Sarah Zachary, and then Gabrielle Pickle, and then um, Dave Halls. What were your conclusions with respect to whether Ms. Gutierrez was provided enough time to inventory and inspect the dummy rounds from her employer? We came to the conclusion that she was not afforded time to conduct her duties to the best of her diligence. Rush Movie Productions. Um, identified a, a hazard, a workplace hazard, working with firearms, and they adopted a firearm safety policies, but they totally failed to enforce them, train their employees on them, practice them, reference them, no, nothing. They, they adopted it and it stopped at the word adoption. Nothing further happened. Do you have any conclusions um, about the quality of the investigation by the sheriffs at the scene? Their response was probably not what it should be. There were, yes, there were hundreds of people on that ranch, but if you narrow it down to who was in the church at the time of the shooting and who may have had involvement with the case, for example, the people that were just outside, uh, there was really about 20 people. Lieutenant Benavides um, took possession of the firearm with an ungloved hand, and he grabbed it right around the cylinder. So the largest portion of the revolver is how he picked up the revolver, put it into his vehicle, at another occasion pulled it out of his vehicle and put it back on the car. He did the same thing with the ammo boxes from the uh, cart. So you definitely can't preserve evidence by touching things with your bare hands. One aspect of it that's still kind of a mystery to me is when the lieutenant arrived on the scene, first two things he asked for was the gun and the armor. I um, thought that was a little unusual. He didn't seem to be the least concer concerned of who the shooter was and what that individual status was. Um, he placed Ms. Catetas into his marked unit, which is pretty common, uh, also considering that you know, she had some anxiety issues and so on. Uh, but it immediately became clear she was not free to leave. Every other individual on that ranch was free to walk around, talk to anyone, talk on their phone, do anything they wanted to do, um, except Ms. Gutierrez. There's no controversy that the gun that was used in the shooting is the gun that was in Mr. Baldwin's hand, right? True. OK. Um, and the reason that the projectile can't be matched to the firearm is because the projectile went through uh, two people and it was so heavily uh, uh, damaged because it went through two human beings, uh, there wasn't enough marking to match it to the bore of the gun. Isn't that true? That's true. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Kelly Kraft, who is live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, outside the courthouse, of course, inside the courtroom today. Great to see you, Kelly. Uh, another big day as this case uh, starts to wrap up a little bit. The defense calling a firearm expert to the stand today. 
Uh, he, sure, yes. And Vinny, I just wanted to tell you, the prosecution just walked out of the courtroom just minutes ago. So you said big day, quite a day, they said to me as they were just leaving. Defense counsel, of course, put on its case today. And as you just mentioned, that firearms expert on the stand. And boy, did this lead to some, oh, some iffy moments inside the courtroom, to say the least, with some people in the gallery ducking at one point. This is when Frank Cousy, he was on the stand and he was talking about firearm safety. And he said one of the first things in firearm safety is you never put your finger on the trigger. Let's listen to some of his direct examination. And here is a Genex revolver. So, Your Honor, I'm going to object. All right, first of all, everybody's nervous because you have not demonstrated to us that they are unloaded. So before you start showing us the weapons, make sure they're unloaded, including that one that you just touched. So the firearms expert was demonstrating how to cock and uncock the gun. And when he brought out the gun, this is when some people in the gallery, especially the row of people sitting in front of me, began to duck as if he's pointing the gun at them. And then as you can see in some of the video that it appears that he ends up pointing the gun at the judge. Of course, special prosecutor Carrie Morrissey doesn't miss a beat in this case. And she got up there and asked him about this on her cross-examination. Let's listen. Do you agree with me that basic gun safety requires that the handler of the gun not point the gun at anyone? If it's a real gun, yes. Do you agree with me that while you were sitting here in the courtroom, uh, you pulled out a gun and you pointed it at the judge? I do not. You disagree? I pointed the gun into this space up here, never directly at the judge. So, Vinny, this witness was really interesting to listen to because uh, his background, and he talked about all of his experience with guns, his experience on movie sets, and it was impressive to listen to. But then, of course, when he started pulling the guns out, things got a little bit wacky inside the courtroom, as you just watched. I, wow! Are you kidding me? <laughs> we got a firearms expert talking about safety and the barrels being pointed in all these directions towards people. I just saw it myself. There it goes, towards the judge. Then he puts it on the table. It's going towards uh, the attorneys in the gallery. Thank goodness there's an officer there next to him. Like, I, I, wow. I've seen a lot of guns in courtrooms. You can feel courtrooms. the nervous reaction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little yes, situational yes. awareness. Holy mackerel! I, 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 I don't know what the jury does with that. What does the jury do with that? Like, he, he, <laughs> this is an in, in, insanity inside the courtroom. I, I don't think it went as defense counsel had planned. No. No, I, I, I'm, you know, as this is I'm trying to spin in my head, how can either side spin this in their way? Uh, both sides will figure out a way to try to use it because uh, you can't ignore that moment. You can't ignore that moment. Like I can see the defense saying, ladies and gentlemen, do you remember when the expert that we called up and the barrel was pointed and people were ducking? Well, that's why you don't point a gun at people. That's what Alec Baldwin right, did. Exactly. Not Hannah Gutierrez. So I could see them. Wow. Okay. Whew. Now let's get to some of the other things that happened today. Hannah Gutierrez, her, her father showed up today? 
Yes, he did. And I got a chance to talk with him, Vinny, because he's on the witness list for defense counsel. Now, if Jason Bowles is going to call him, we're not certain. We did ask Jason Bowles that tonight. So still not clear if he is going to call him yet. Uh, but he was there standing outside the courtroom, sitting there. And he's a very distinguished older gentleman. And he kind of had a little entourage around him. But he is expected to testify at least on the witness stand. Or uh, he's on the witness list. Let me clarify that. But again, if Jason's going to call him, we'll have to wait and see what happens tomorrow. Also, I heard you talk about Hannah Gutierrez, the defendant, of course, in this case. Will we hear from her? We also asked Jason Bowles that as well tonight. I have asked Hannah Gutierrez that myself, and she has told me we will see, and Jason Bowles says we will see tomorrow. That's a big decision. You, you know, it's the probably the last decision you have to make as a, as a um, defendant and the defense team as well. It's a big one. But Hannah's father in the middle of all of this as well. I mean, that's why she's in the business. That's why she's in the business. Yes. So um, that's huge. Now, um, we're at the point of the case, right? The state rests. And when that happens, the defense is trying to get a directed verdict. Um, to me, it's rarely granted. But to me, I always listen to them closely because they seem to give you a a preview of what you may hear during the closing arguments in the case. So what, what did you uh, notice today? One of the main things that was argued by defense counsel, Vinny, is that the state has not proven that Hannah Gutierrez brought live ammunition to the set of rust. And we have talked about this. It is unclear how that live ammunition actually got on set. So that was one of the main points that they made. Also, what they said is that if someone shoots a gun in their backyard, no one is really looking at the person who loaded that gun. If somebody else loaded that gun, they're looking at the person who pulled the trigger. In this case, Alec Baldwin, of course, he has said that he did not pull the trigger. But that was one of the arguments that defense counsel attempted to make, that Hannah was not the one that pulled the trigger. In this case, Alec Baldwin was. But uh, the state got up there, had a very long argument saying that this directed verdict should be denied, saying that Hannah Gutierrez failed to follow safety protocols, that she is the one that brought the live ammunition on set and said that photographs prove that. That's what they're saying. That some photographs that were taken before Seth Kenny's ammunition got on set show that she is the one that is responsible for, for bringing that live ammunition on set. The judge said, of course, as you know, Vinny, you look at directed verdicts in the light most favorable to the state, and the judge denied defense counsel's directed verdict motion. So let, let's think about this for a moment, because those defense arguments are very important in this case because I think everyone's agreed things didn't go the way they're supposed to go right it, it's obvious that they didn't go but do you do you have to prove that she brought the live ammo is, is the jury going to be needed to be convinced of that and what what element does additional negligence play in all of this right if we're talking about a civil case like you talk about, all right, they're partly responsible, they're partly responsible. But in a criminal context, this is rare that we have a situation where we have different people contributing to the negligence and recklessness on a movie set. So if, they did, if, if someone else didn't act negligently, the result wouldn't have happened. Does that absolve her of criminal liability, right? If Alec Baldwin doesn't put his finger on the trigger, then, you know, she didn't do anything wrong. Arguably, Vinny, there's no in Vinny, there's no question that the jurors do appear perplexed as to who brought that live ammunition on set, as we all seem to be. They've taken a lot of notes during all of that testimony. But there's also been all of the state, state's evidence talking about that she was negligent and they brought crew members forth and they said that Hannah Gutierrez did not handle her role like a normal armorer would from sets that they had been on in the past. But we did hear from the ocean, OSHA investigators today, the New Mexico OSHA investigators, and they were saying again how it wasn't really Hannah Gutierrez, it was all of the people above Hannah Gutierrez, the production of Rust and how they were fined. They were 
violating safety protocols. So it's going to be interesting to see how much of a factor that plays in the jurors' minds in regard to who brought the live ammunition on set. But, you know, it's just involuntary manslaughter here. Defense counsel did get a bit of a win. He said he wanted to mitigate some risks here because it's negligent use of a firearm is also going to be included in the jury instructions. Vinny. All right. Um, yeah, tomorrow's a big day. A big, big day. Kelly Craft in the middle of it. Thank you so much. We'll speak again tomorrow. All right. Um, we're going to get into these relationships on the set of Rust. Who was in charge of who? Who was working for who? And how does that impact the way people testified about that big issue of where did the live ammo come from? We're going to talk about that plus coming up next hour. In Kissimmee, Florida, the tragic murder of 13-year-old Madeline Soto. She vanished when her mother's boyfriend allegedly took her to school. Her body was found days later, miles away. Her mother and the boyfriend both gave interviews. We heard what they said, but what did their body language say? At 819, we have evidence that shows Stephen Stearns returning to the complex and Madeline was visible in that vehicle. We believe she was already dead at that time. I'm the armor. Yeah, at least I was. A famous actor in a movie set accident that ended in tragedy. I turn and hump because the gun goes off. Now, Alec Baldwin and the film's armorer have both been charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just because it's an accident doesn't mean that it's not criminal. Court TV takes you inside the courtroom as Hannah Gutierrez faces a jury. The Baldwin movie shooting trial. Live coverage weekday mornings. Only on Court TV. Up. Uh. No, there's no, there's no real interviews like any time in film. Film is a very weird industry. Word of mouth. Word of mouth by all means. And I think it's so weird how like secretive it is almost, you know, like it's really hard to get on anything unless you know somebody. You've got to know somebody to get the job in the industry, right? Well, it's like that in most industries. Uh, it really is in the law, other places to get, you know, particular jobs that you want. It helps. Uh, in that industry, I think you really need to know somebody. But let's look at these connections on the set of Rust because I think it's really fascinating to look at because of the way it could impact, um, you know, the way people testified and some of the facts found uh, by this jury about how that live round ended up in Alec Baldwin's gun. Let's begin with Thel Reed and Hannah Gutierrez. Thel Reed, legendary armorer and father of Hannah Gutierrez. Uh, and he trained his daughter in the art of <clears throat> movie armory. Then you've got um, Thel Reed's connection to Seth Kenny, okay? Thel Reed is a colleague of Prop and Ammo supplier Seth Kenny, both working in the industry. The two met on the set of the movie Django Unchained. You remember that movie, legendary movie? Uh, they became friends. So these two are friendly with each other, and uh, Kenny convinced the... Uh, uh, the prop master for the series 1883 to hire Thel as a gun coach for the actors. So Seth is getting Thel a job to train the actors on the set of 1883 with live ammo. And we heard all about that testimony from Seth Kenny uh, with the live ammo that he was providing uh, to that show, 1883. And then let's look at the relationship of Seth Kenny and Hannah Gutierrez. Seth Kenny and his company supplied ammunition for the movie The Old Way, starring Nicolas Cage. Hannah Gutierrez was hired as the armorer for that movie. So again, is that Seth doing a favor for Thel? You know, what, you know what, what's going on here, right? There's, a, there's a, this connection in her first movie. Then another important connection, very important in this trial, Seth Kenny and Sarah Zachary. Sarah Zachary is an employee of Seth Kenny's company, PDQ Props, and she is the prop master for the movie Rust. So she's not working for the movie Rust, she's working for Seth Kenny, whose company is doing work for the movie Rust. Um, and at Seth Kenny's direction, Sarah Zachary hires Hannah Gutierrez as the armorer and prop assistant for Rust. Wow. And then you've got 
Hannah Gutierrez and Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls. Hannah and, and Sarah both work on the set of Rust with Dave Halls. Hannah and, and Sarah are outranked on the set of Rust by first assistant director and safety manager Dave Halls, who has already pleaded guilty for his role in this fatal shooting. So you see these connections. Um, let's bring in our guests. Joining us in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, actor, assistant director, and producer Thomas Johnston, who has three movies coming out this year called They Whisper, Verdian, and Half-Lives. In New York City, film director Stefano DeFray, and in Los Angeles, California, entertainment reporter and host of Kinsey's L.A. Diaries on Talk TV, Kinsey Schofield is back with us. All right, uh, Kinsey, I'm going to start with you. Let's talk about um, these two, I, I, don't know, I don't know if they're legends or not, but I mean, they've been in the business a long time, Thel Reed and, and, and Seth Kenny. These two guys, I've got to think, are involved in a lot of productions uh, in Hollywood when people are using guns. I mean, Legends is a good way to describe both of them. 81-year-old Thel Reed is a famed armorer and movie consultant with over 70 years in the entertainment industry. He secured his first onset position in 1955 on the set of Gunsmoke. Since then, he's worked on Hollywood blockbusters like Tombstone, L.A. Confidential, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I mean, celebrities like Sharon Stone, Brad Pitt, Russell Crowe, they not only know his name, but they might even know his phone number. He's a colorful character in the best possible way gloating about all types of achievements on his sets, like holding the United States quick draw record or surviving a bear attack. According to IMDb, Reed also worked as a bodyguard for Evil Knievel, but was dubbed, uh, you know, the gun coach to the stars after coaching the likes of Steve McQueen. When it comes to Seth Kinney, uh, he lives in Lake Havasu City, where his company PDQ, Arm and Prop, holds two licenses for dealing in firearms issued by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. Um, you know, he he's a legend as well. He worked for five years at one of LA's largest prop houses, Hand Prop Room, where he worked with like AMC's The Walking Dead. And as we heard through testimony today, you know, working on 1883. So obviously um, a, a respected individual. So how does this work in the business? Um Thomas, let me ask you, you know, getting the job. I'm trying to understand how this 24-year-old young woman gets the job of being in charge of the guns on a Western starring Alec Baldwin. Is it all about these connection, who knows who, I'll get you this, you do this, I do that for you? Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely never a, a ad in the newspaper where you can apply to work on a movie set. So it's a, it's a lot of... You know, who you know, obviously, because they've been trained by somebody, they know somebody, they were raised in the business. Um, you know, it, it's it's not, it, it's it's a job by job thing for sure. However, um, having someone be in their second movie as armor on a Western where movies are in every scene, uh, it's a bit ludicrous just even, even hearing that. And, and, you know, look, when you hire somebody in her position who's got no experience, uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you hire a production assistant and say, hey, make sure nobody walks through this way. And then a star or a producer walks, comes to walk through, like, they don't feel like they have the authority to say, like, hey, you can't do that because of, you know, the, 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 they're scared, you know? And, and I feel like that may have happened a lot with her. Um, and she may have known, but scared to say something. Um, so I think some of that probably was happening with her. And it, it was just not, that's not smart, to, especially with guns. I mean, that's, that's even if they're fake. And it's a Western. Fired, it's it's, it's all about guns, right? Like, uh, so, Stefano, I want to put this up exactly. on the screen. Because as, as Thomas said, this was her second movie, right? So her first movie, this is a report from TMZ. The armorer on Rust got an earful from one Nicolas Cage when she was working on his movie earlier this year, and it doesn't sound like he was confident in her abilities either. The veteran actor reportedly got mad and yelled at Hannah over the summer while shooting his newest flick, The Old Way, down in Montana. This after she apparently fired off weapons around the crew without warning, not once but twice. 
Sharon Waxman reports after the second time in three days of Gutierrez testing a weapon near everyone else unexpectedly, Cage yelled, make an announcement, you just blew my beep eardrums out, then stormed off. So um, your thoughts, uh, Stefano, about the ex level of experience and coming off of the old way as now in charge of a, of a Western? I mean, it's completely, completely egregious. You can tell uh, a, a few things. First of all, you can tell also the the uh, supplier who was upset with Hannah when the discharge went off on October 16th was upset at her reaction of being very emotional and being unprofessional. You know that this bodes badly for her on her defense. You know that this is establishing her as someone who is not competent, doesn't know what she's doing, and is not able to handle this job. I also want to touch on a little bit of what Thomas said, agreeing 100% with him, which is that when you're a, a parent teaching your child, sometimes you, you slip through the cracks and you're a little bit looser on them. And it looks to be the case that she was not only not properly trained, but got this job through nepotism and, you know, to the, to the detriment of the entire crew. Yeah, and to me that was evident by some of the testimony where she didn't know, like, you've got to gather up the dummy rounds. You don't just discard, oh, we, yeah, we lost a bunch of them, we need, we need a bunch more. It's like... And she's texting, someone should have told me this before. So uh, I agree with you there. Let's take a listen to a little bit of testimony from uh, Sarah Zachary. Um, and this again, this is after the shooting of Helena Hutchins. After a fatal shooting on the set, this is what she did. In reality, uh, what she did is she threw away rounds from two revolvers, is that correct? Correct. And that was right, uh, that was after the shooting, correct? Yes. Now, after the shooting, do you recall how many minutes uh, went by, just roughly, before you threw away those rounds? I don't recall. In that time frame, you also had a conversation with Seth Kenny, correct? Yes. And on that conversation, you had texted him previously before that and said emergency? After the incident, yes. Okay, so the reaction is, get rid of some evidence, and, and call the man who supplied the ammo. Thomas, this is, this is insanity, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a fatal shooting we're talking about, and two people were shot. And, and sorry I'm, I'm laughing, but, y you know, everybody on set is a little bit at fault because the first time that you hear a live rounds on set, it, it, it should have been taken care of right then. Hey, listen, let's go through everyone. They should never be there or around. If they knew that should have anybody from top to bottom that that shouldn't have happened, but you know throwing it away, I feel like it's the Spider-Man meme when they're all kind of pointing at each other, um, you know, and, and everybody's at fault a little bit in this, which is unfortunate, you know. Um, it's hard to hear. Yeah, Stefano, what did you think about the the arrangement of of who was reporting to who? So you had a a prop master not employed by the film but works for the works for the separate company that's been hired i guess by the film and they sort of handpicked hannah and hannah is working under one of them it's to me it's an unusual arrangement but i don't know if that's unusual for a film it's a completely unusual, uh, completely unusual arrangement. You're completely right, Vinny. I mean, the armor should supersede the props master because the props master is not specifically required to know 100% about guns and the ammunition that you would be working with. Uh, so, th you know, she's, Hannah's job is supposed to be the, the highest role of the person who deals with the safety and knowing, checking the supplies from Seth Kenny, checking all that material, and also making sure that, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're basically the, the head person on that, on that uh, job. You can easily see that people are kind of carrying her Right. You can hear in the testimony that people are sort of carrying her along and basically making up for some of the um, lack of leadership, let's say, uh, in her in her in her job role. Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head with that.
Great job, everyone. We're out of time for tonight, but Thomas Johnston, Stefano DeFray, Kenzie Schofield, thank you all so much for your insight. We appreciate it. When we come back, let's talk about Hannah Gutierrez tomorrow. Big decision. Should she testify? If she does, what would that cross-examination be like? That's next. Take it easy. So it's Hannah Gutierrez leaving the courthouse saying, have a nice day. Um, I mean, see, this trial is different, right? We're not talking about people who are evil. We cover a lot of trials with evil people, right? Murderers, killers, serial killers, child killers. That's not this case. That's not who she is. That's not who Alec Baldwin is. No, no, no one associate going on trial here is evil because it's not that kind of a case. But what's it going to be like if she testifies? Should she testify? Let's bring our special guest joining us from Los Angeles, California, criminal trial attorney Sarah Azari. You can check her out in her new podcast, The Presumption. It's on all podcast platforms. <laughs> and there she is with the very handsome Jim Griffin. So I guess, uh, Sarah, are you moving down to the low country now? So you'd be closer to Jim? Oh, hell no. <laughs> no, we do virtual. Good to be with you, Counselor. Oh, good to see you. Okay, I want to show you some images of Hannah Gutierrez because it's been quite a transformation uh, in what we've seen just in her physical appearance. So we begin, here she is mm -hmm. in her police interview. This is the first interview right after the shooting coming off of the set. Um, this is how she looked during the, the filming of the movie. Um, then she comes in for a second police interview with her attorney, and it's different, right? She's not, she's not like out in the middle of the desert loading guns. It's more, more professional. But then when she showed up in court, almost didn't recognize her, like a, an, an incredible um, makeover. She, I think she looks great. Um, your thoughts about the jury seeing this transformation because they've seen the videos and they've seen her in court is it, is it a plus is mm -hmm. it a minus for her or does it mean nothing i mean look it's i think it's a wash in this case i mean we do this with our clients because it's the best way that we can distance the defendant from the crime whether it was evil or not it doesn't matter i think the idea is that the this person could have never been negligent. This person could have never been evil, whatever the case might be. But the problem here, Vinny, is that, you know, the, for you know nearly three years, um, her image and the image of Alec Baldwin, the, everybody on the Rust set has been ingrained on people's, you know, on this jury's uh, brain. And, and also they're seeing her on the footage with this sort of punk rock, colorful hair and hipster outfits. And so, um, I think you have to be careful because if you overdo it, and I think the best example that comes to mind is Amber Heard. You know, when Amber Heard look, came in looking like a Stepford wife, you know, it, it was a little too much. You know, it looked sort of disingenuous. And so um, you got to be careful, but it is strategy and it is something that, uh, you know, typically is a good idea because you don't want the jury to look at the client like how the client looked <laughs> yeah at the time. I, I know what you mean i know what you mean but it, i want you to take a listen to the testimony of rebecca smith who worked for craft services on on rust because if she takes a stand i think this might come up on cross did anything unusual happen when you left miss gutierrez's room yes she asked me if i could hold on to something for her i said yes she put it in my hand and I walked out as there was a knock on the door. It was a clear Ziploc baggie with a green small Ziploc baggie inside, and there was powder inside the green baggie. What color was the powder? White. Okay, Sarah, will drug use or alleged drug use keep her from taking the stand because you got to face those type of questions? Is it a big deal uh, in this case? Well, one of the charges is evidence tampering. It's the idea of her trying to uh, get rid of the cocaine. Um, and I think one of the instructions was supposed to be, can we can we say substance as opposed to cocaine? And the judge said, no, cocaine's cocaine. Let's call a spade a spade. So 
it's really bad for her because where there's drugs, there should be no guns and vice versa. Guns and drugs don't go together. And that's one of the reasons I think she should not take the stand, uh, even though that's a de decision that is always risky. It's a fluid process. We make that decision sort of sometimes at the last minute. But more importantly, Vinny, it's also this whole defense. The defense has been the blame game. You know, so-and-so was at fault. The entire set was dangerous. OSHA violations, et cetera. Well, two things can be true. There could be a really unset safe and other people could be at fault and she too could be at fault. You know, one of your other guests just said, you know, she was, she had the ultimate duty, right? So again, it doesn't take away her culpability. And I think the problem with her taking the stand is she will get eviscerated. Um, it's not a good look for her to out of her mouth engage right. in that blame game. It's one thing if her attorneys argue it um, or allude to it. I, but think, I, I, I think I agree with you. I don't, I don't think she's going to testify. Yeah. I don't think she will in this case. Sarah, we're out of time tonight. So either. But we'll do it again for sure. Check out the new podcast. <laughs>